Welcome to Power Your Life Today. I'm Christy Joe, mind and body strategist. Today we are talking with Rodney Owen about processing anger and other emotions. This is power session number 37 and you are in for a treat. In our conversation, you're going to hear about how a near-death experience helped him gain the passion to start his practice of helping men deal with anger issues. He's going to tell us about the five core emotions and how we experience them, how anger can actually be a masking emotion, what it means to process emotion, how nobody ever died from crying too much. He's going to give you ideas of how to help other people in your life manage their anger. And also we'll talk about parenting techniques when it comes to managing anger around your children. This is a really powerful discussion. We do appreciate you sharing it with those who will also benefit. We know that as we improve our lives, everybody around us can also improve theirs. This is about powering ourselves to live a life of more value, more love and service. By the way, if you are new to power your life today, I would love to share with you my free audio tracks to help you plow through resistance over at poweryourlifetoday.com. Whether it's emotional, mental, or spiritual trials, mindset coaching is where we can find solutions and begin making more progress. These five audio tracks are going to channel you through lack of motivation, emotional stressors, and just that feeling of being stuck. Now this is free and my gift to you. So head over to poweryourlifetoday.com and get those five audio tracks today. A bit about me, I've, I've been counseling now for probably about eight years and I started off working on a suicide hotline here in Australia called Lifeline. And from there, I've, I've had lots of different experiences with mental health and drug and alcohol addiction and things like that. Um, how I started my own practice, uh, bloke support, um, in 2011, it was actually uh, a bit of an extreme reaction to a near-death experience I had. I, um, I had a contracted swine flu and I ended up in an induced coma uh, for 11 days on life support and hospital and I nearly died twice. And so when I woke up, it's like, I've got to actually do something. So working with men is something I, I sort of recently worked out of being sort of heading towards this direction my entire life, um, starting back in childhood, you know, issues with my dad and who had his own demons. And so now I guess it's come full circle. I'm trying to sort of help people avoid the same, the same traps. Wow. That's, that's incredible. So a near death experience that was what, six years ago, you said 2011. Yeah, yeah, 2010 actually, oh, sorry. 2010. Um, okay. tw yeah, the end of 2010 and then 2011 after I, because I spent three months recovering, um, and that's when I started Bloke Support in 2011. So it's been quite the journey for you since then. So we're excited to, you know, help everybody understand anger a little bit more. Well, let's go into talking exactly about anger. What is it? Why do we experience it? All right, so I'll answer, I'll answer the first part first. Um, what is anger? Anger is, is purely a, it's an emotion. Um, what I believe is we only have five core emotions. Uh, so we have anger, of course. We have happiness. We have sadness. We have fear. And we also have guilt. And all the other emotions that we experience are just nuances of those five core emotions. So it's the same emotion but felt to a different um, intensity. So for instance, with anger, um, you've got frustration, annoyed, um, you know, sort of displeased, all these sorts of different uh, ways of uh, feeling anger, but at a different intensity. And so why, why we feel, um, particularly, well, why we feel all these emotions, they, they actually help us, help guide us through our daily lives, help us make decisions, help us work out whether we're on the right path or not. Um, anger is really interesting because out of those five core emotions, it's the only emotion that is not, I guess, pure. And it's, it's really a masking emotion and it protects us from other harmful emotions. So let's say if we're scared, uh, that's, that fear is sort of 
really coming towards us. It's almost like an attack towards us. But if we throw up anger to protect us from that fear, instead of the fear attacking us, we then sort of push it out to the rest of the world. So instead of getting scared, we get angry at someone else or the world or or whatever, if that makes wow. sense. Yeah. Why Why would we be afraid of feeling fear? Well, because it's it's not um it's it's not a pleasant pleasant uh, emotion, but um you know if if we're trying to you know if we're f- sort of feeling fear about talking on stage for instance, mm-hmm. um it's not a good one because we wouldn't necessarily throw anchor out at, uh, at this one, but if we're feeling fear about talking on stage, the fear is going to make us stay down. Mm-hmm. So we need to mask that emotional we need to sort of come through it um particularly with with men you know with men uh, anger is a really good one because you know we don't want to look afraid in front of other men you know if if you've got a bunch of guys who are out doing something really stupid um something that's probably going to get us really hurt or killed as you know young blokes young men tend to like to do (laughs) Um, we're going to want to suppress that fear so we don't get ridiculed and called a wuss. But, you know, th- we, we have that fear for a reason. It's to te- teach us that's something that's really stupid that's going to get you injured or killed. Don't do that. So is there – let's go back to those five emotions because I yep. want to make sure we understand. So you said anger, yep. happiness, mm-hmm. sadness, yep. guilt, and fear. Yep. Did I get them right? Yeah. Yep, that's it. Okay. So each of those is kind of like a, a category header with a lot of different emotions that are underneath them. Are we understanding yeah. that right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So is there something to be said for if we don't know what we're feeling? Like, do you have any recommendations for how we sort out what's going on inside of us and try and trace it to one of those five? Or how, how would you help us try to navigate if we don't know how to specifically identify what it is we're feeling? It's a really good question because quite often we don't know what we're feeling. It's when we t- can kind of get mixed emotions. So we sort of got different experiences from a lot of different emotions and one way of helping work that out is literally by talking Mm -hmm. talking about what what it is that you're i guess experiencing in your body and you know what's what's happened in the lead up to this and in doing that what you also do is you vent out these emotions as well so it's sort of in in sort of trying to help help um, work them out and process them we then vent them out of ourselves as well so this word process, I know many people are afraid of it because they don't really understand it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, what is, what is processing and how do we do it? If this is totally new to us, where do we start? You said talking. Is there anything else that's helpful? Uh, well, yeah, especially if you're uh, by yourself, journaling as well is also really good. Anything that's going to help express the emotion. A lot of people um, turn towards art as well of helping it, um, to vent and express their emotions. Um, so yeah, we've got journaling, we've got, um, you know, art, we've got music. All these lots of different creative endeavours can really help to uh, express that. Um, what we mean by processing is, is really sort of, you know, pulling back everything and, and understanding what's going on, helping put everything in its place so it's sort of, fits within within your own own mind if that makes yeah. if I'm making sense there <laughs> yeah absolutely so I'm sitting here thinking okay personal application so a little bit about me I never really considered myself that artsy but as you're describing mm-hmm. this processing I have three things come to mind number one I'm a dancer I love mm-hmm. to dance and I express myself that way number two I play the piano and just mm-hmm. last week I was playing the piano and just tears came and I was like, what is going on? Why am I crying? And, yeah. And so is that maybe that it evoked some emotion that I couldn't have processed in another way? Yeah, that's, that's definitely what it sounds like. With, with crying, what's, what's happening there is when we cry, what we're doing is we're purging overwhelming emotions so i mean have you ever noticed for example that if you're feeling not great if you're feeling maybe a bit a bit low you start playing the sort of 
lower, you know, sort of more depressing type songs, but when you're happy, you play something a bit more upbeat. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. So, so yes, yeah, so that's, that's uh, an example of you using your music to sort of tap into that emotion. And when, when you're crying that time, you know, because you're bringing it to the surface, and so now it's it's there and it, it just comes flooding out. Hmm. That's, that sounds like, on a logical scale, a very healthy way to process emotion. I'm hoping it is. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. Crying is is healthy. Like when when I have a client um, talking to me about anything, if I if if they start crying, then I've I've done what I need to do. That's you know that's part of the goal. You know, helping people to cry is helping them to release these emotions and also too when we cry um, what happens in the body is uh, our body releases a whole bunch of chemicals and it's a bit like um, a drug afterwards and mm-hmm. you know, it helps us to feel better um, so so crying as well as getting rid of the emotions afterwards you then start to feel better and you know you've just let go of a lot of stuff that you're probably holding on to as well when you start crying so you're crying is a very healthy way of of dealing with these things wow so is there ever a point that there is such a thing as too much crying no no i don't think so people are always worried that you know i've heard people say if i start crying i'm worried i'm not going to be able to stop Mm-hmm. Um, but like no one, there's no record of anywhere, any, any time who, who have just cried forever, mm-hmm. you know, or, or cried, you know, to death. No, this never happened. <laughs> Nobody's um, cried to death. It, Hallelujah. It, it, you know, what's, what's going to happen is you will eventually stop. Once all of that is purged, you will, you will stop. Quite often people will cry themselves to sleep. It's because once they get rid of all these emotions and they're, they're able to then relax and fall asleep. Mm. Um, so, so no, this, I, I don't believe there's ever, so, ever a thing as too much crying. Um, I believe there can be crying in the wrong time or wrong place. Um, but never too much, especially if, you know, you've had big things going on. If you're releasing some of that emotion that, that's, um, you know, that you're holding on to. Because a lot of people, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to cry, they don't want to express emotion, particularly men, and they don't want other people to see them lose it so much, um, like lose it emotionally. And so they'll suppress that emotion, but it's not going away. All we're doing is we're just packing it down. Eventually, you're going to keep piling more and more emotion on top of it, and it's going to come out in some way. If you can, if it can come out through crying, fantastic. But a lot of cases I, I, I see um, with my clients, it comes out in ways of, you know, sort of drug or alcohol addiction or violence or something destructive. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy Joe, founder of Body Buddies, a body transformation company. I want to help you transform your life into a healthier and happier you. I've already helped thousands of people change their lives. Go to PowerFoodsLifestyle.com to get your free copy of The Power Foods Lifestyle. This book will help you change your relationship with food, teach you strategic eating for fat loss and more energy, and help you eliminate the all-or-nothing diet approach. What do you have to lose besides the weight? Get your free copy of The Power Foods Lifestyle at PowerFoodsLifestyle.com. How are people negatively handling emotion or lack of, you know, processing that's leading them into these violent situations and how do we avoid that? Okay. Um, Basically, when when people sort of lead themselves into these violent situations, it's because they're not dealing with with issues that have happened they they carry on um as if nothing's wrong they they don't talk about it they don't process it and they just suppress any emotion and really what what we can do is the opposite um you know talking about it purging it getting you know some way of processing and venting Uh, a lot of people particularly if they've experienced some sort of trauma or something Mm -hmm. They're very afraid to, to go back into that because like, no, it's happened. I just want to leave it in the past. But in order to process it, we do need to go over it. And I don't suggest that you just 
let anyone go over it with you. I, I do recommend, particularly if it's some sort of traumatic event, like you know, you, you, there's been an assault or something like that. I do recommend you work on it with a, a professional counselor because you need someone who knows what to do with it. Absolutely. You know, if you just if you just start telling you know your best friend or something, and then you get to a point where you've relived this experience and the other person doesn't know what to do, that can open up a whole um, world of trouble. Mm -hmm. But act actively processing, dealing with it, going back into it and giving it a, a place um, where it doesn't affect you anymore. Do you think the majority of people are handling it or are the majority of people afraid and they're suppressing, particularly in the case of traumatic experiences? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of people, the, the majority of people will tend to not do anything with it or you know they might come at the come through the experience and they go oh that I, i'm i'm handling it okay mm -hmm. and, and you know so they keep going they, they they say to themselves i don't need to to see anyone i don't need to talk to anyone um and, and quite often that's the case and it will be years later that they realize oh there's something something wrong here perfect perfect example i'm not sure if if you guys over in the u.s have heard about it but just recently um prince harry has come out and spoken about how he dealt with the grief of his mother's death back in the the 90s yeah. and he didn't he didn't for a long time he he thought he needed to carry on and and he suppressed everything and it wasn't until only just a few years ago that he realized that holding on to it for too long wasn't doing him any good and he finally went and sought some some therapy so that's a perfect example of what the majority of of people out there are doing and that is a perfect example. Ironically, I read an article on it last night, and I never read the news, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, case in point right there. So, and I also remember in the article, it talked about how he said this, this suppression led to multiple near breakdowns and seeking mm. different things. I, I can't remember if he did. He did military service, right? Yeah. And, and I don't know how much of that was related, but I think the moral of the story here is that any time something happens, we need to actively be willing to look for ways to process instead of just thinking, I'll be okay, just get busy, forget about it. I think that's what usually the, the quote, best friend advice is, right? Like, oh, just get yourself busy, don't think about it. And exactly, exactly. And there is there is some merit to that, to sort of, you know, moving on, getting busy, but it's it's a balance. So yes, we need to sort of, keep busy and move on because if we're just sort of sitting there and, and all we're doing is thinking about it, then that's not doing us any good either. Right. So keeping busy, there is some merit to that, but there's, it's a balance. So you need to keep busy, but then you need to actively um, work through it as well at the same time. Um, perfect example, another thing too is after I, fin um, after I came out of my near-death experience, I... I was very positive and I was very upbeat and I was very grateful to be alive. I wasn't scared or anything. And I thought I'm, I'm okay, but I still went, I had a few sessions with a counselor to just help her help me move through it. Mm -hmm. So I spoke about it and, you know, you know, went over it again and, and she sort of looked for all the warning signs. And after just a few, a, a few sessions, I, I was fine, but I went and did that even though I felt okay because I'd still gone through a traumatic experience. Wow, and that's really wise to have done that. So I'm, I'm thinking many of our listeners are probably nodding their heads saying, yes, I can realize how important this is and I commit to processing my emotion and seeking to find those outlets. But what if they're, let's say, married to somebody who is not? <laughs> how, how can they help the other person maybe embrace a little bit more of this processing without overstepping or coming across as controlling? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point because, you know, when we're, you know, we have people in our lives and we want them to, to do well and seek help, we can't actually make them. Even if someone were like, you know, I often get um, women dragging their husbands in, into my office, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean they're going to talk. Sure. Um, so really, um, be, by being very supportive and talking to, to you know, the partner or family member and saying, I noticed some differences 
you know, maybe it's some sort of emotional differences or whatever, but just bring them up. So I, I'm noticing this and you give them that feedback. And then it's important to let them know that you're concerned because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So really tapping into that and saying, I'm just really concerned because this isn't you and, and I really think that maybe you need to see someone. And just letting them know that it's an option and that you're there and ready to support them, but you're not going to force them. You know, people have to do it in their own time, otherwise it's not going to have any benefit either. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So my next question, I'm wondering, still dealing with other people and interactions mm-hmm. with others, is how are we supposed to respond when somebody else is angry? There's, And maybe we could go through a few different scenarios. Mm-hmm. Uh, would that be helpful? Or do you want to talk about it first? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk about it and, and you know, we'll, we'll see what scenarios pop up. Um, okay. I think the, the, the first important thing to realize is when someone's angry, determine are they directing their anger towards you or are they directing that anger towards like something else or someone else you know are they just angry at the world are they angry at god or are they actually attacking you um because they're two very different different things uh if they're um if they're not directing their anger towards you it's a lot easier to sit there and let them vent it off and let them really, really what, what we like to call drain out. And because once they, they get all that anger out and then they get in touch with what the underlying emotion is, it's a bit different if they're directing it towards you because when they're directing it towards you, you feel um, threatened. You feel like they're on the attack and that's when you feel unsafe. And so then your fear takes over and that's what guides all of your behavior. And so um, you know, if you're trying to support someone, you, you know, you don't want to feel unsafe or scared when doing it. Um, and, and this, this is something that used to happen to us uh, at the, the suicide hotline. We get a lot of people who were just angry and they would direct their anger towards us. And so, uh, what we need, what we need to say is we need to, um, place a boundary and we need to enforce that boundary in an assertive manner, not aggressive and not passive. So in that sort of middle bit, so we'd say, listen, I can hear that you're angry. However, um, it's not appropriate to yell at me, swear at me, call me those names. And before I can, you know, if I'm going to help you, I just need you to stop. And sometimes that would work. And I go, oh, okay, sorry, I didn't realize. And so then they continue or they keep on. And so then you give them a couple more warnings. Um, if it's going to continue, then, the safest thing for anyone to do is then disengage. Mm. Say, sorry, I, I can't actually help you when you're like this. We better wait until you're until you've calmed down a bit. And if you if you're doing it over the phone, that's when you hang up. If it's someone that's there with you, maybe you need to leave the room or leave the the building, go for a walk, go for a drive, and come back when that anger has subsided. Mm. Um, but yeah, but if if the they're just angry at something else it's easy to sit there and say yeah i can hear that you're angry and and let them let them go through that and that way you can help them get to a stage where they've they've drained off all the anger and then you can find out what the problem is maybe you can then help them deal with it or direct them to, to other help so that basically means we need to stay grounded. We need to stay very non-emotional and not buy into it and get defensive, feeling like they're attacking us. That's what instantly comes to my mind and thinking about how many times have I lashed back. Or, exactly. So you have to kind of take that deep breath and mm-hmm. say, I am calm. I can handle this. This isn't about me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, even even if it is seemingly about you, if you've done something that has then triggered an anger response, um, you know you still can do that. You don't need to to justify. You don't need to defend yourself. You just need to say, okay, you're angry at me. What is it that I've done? And then let that person vent about what it is that has that you may have done that's made them angry. Mm-hmm. And then if it's warranted, because sometimes people like, yeah, you're right. I actually did do something wrong or I said something wrong that way you can then apologize for it if you believe you've you've done that or, or you believe you're in the wrong um or then you can once they're they're not angry anymore and 
you can then sort of come out and say, well, this is the reason why I did that. And maybe then by putting some logic into it, you can help them realize, oh, okay, yeah, you, you, it, you did what you needed to do. Perfect example is when you have parents and particularly like teenage kids. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> the teenage, teenagers have done something that, you know, maybe they've broken curfew or they've, <laughs> um, hit their brother or, or done whatever. And, um, you know, mum and dad puts in a consequence for them and teenagers angry at that. What are you doing that for? You, you know, you're always attacking me and blah, 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 blah. And once they've drained off, mum and dad can say, okay, so you're angry at me because I, you know, took away your phone. However, you took away your phone because, you know, you've broken curfew and you know that, you know, this, this is the time you need to be home and you know what to do and you know what the rules are and this is why we have the rules. And then once, once they've, they've stopped being angry, they've stopped being emotional and you can help them see the logic around what you've done, they can then accept it more easily. Uh, yeah. I've, I've had a, a scenario that stayed in my mind that happened when I was a child. And mm-hmm. it probably stands out to me because my dad is the most patient, loving, kind man you'd ever meet. And yeah. the one time he got mad, <laughs> even though it was probably just for a few moments, I've never forgotten. So I'd love mm. to unpack it together. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll tell it from the child's perspective. And then yep. ho- hopefully I would love for you to explain it from the adult perspective. And then okay. maybe it'll be a good test to see if I've been able to process that. Now, if my parents are listening to this, this does not mean I'm holding on to this. I think it's an interesting <laughs> experience that I can learn from and that everyone can learn from. So it yep. was Mother's Day, and we have seven children in our family. We're two years apart, wow. so you can imagine quite the hustle and bustle, all of us young, running around. My mom, we she's in bed. You know, we wanted to make her breakfast in bed. Mm-hmm. And one of the kids had a big pitcher of orange juice, and they were going over to put it on the counter, and my dad had said, be careful, it's heavy. And who, whatever sibling it was accidentally let it slip and it dropped all over the floor. Orange juice went everywhere. And that's the only time in my life I've heard my dad say a, a swear word. And it wasn't even a bad swear word. It was just like light, right? Mm-hmm. But it was so shocking to me that he got so mad in that moment. Like we all froze. We didn't know what to do. And, yeah. you know, then we cleaned up and he calmed down in like five, ten seconds. But that instant reaction was very alarming. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> as a child, I thought, oh no, like we all are failures, like we've messed up and something's, you know, wrong. Yeah. Well, it, it sounds like, you know, you've, you've got seven kids, they're all trying to do this one task, which is, is make breakfast. And if he's there trying to, um, I guess, control that, it, it sounds like he may have been in the midst of a bit of chaos. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is very stressful. And so maybe he was having a stress response. So he's feeling the emotions, but he's also got a whole bunch of other bodily reactions going, going on at the same time. And so he also predicted as well what was going to happen. He's like, I can see it now. <laughs> this thing's, go- this thing's going to break, but you know what? I'm, I'm not going, I'm, I'm going to just say be careful. <laughs> and then it, it breaks. And so what's happened is, um, maybe he's feeling like the failure. Like, it's like, damn it, I should have taken it away from him because I knew it was too heavy for them. Yeah. Um, but then also, too, um, if he's trying to deal with chaos, then we've got a broken, you know, bottle of orange juice. It's like, damn, that's more chaos. That's more stuff I have to do now. Mm-hmm. I have to make sure this is um, picked up. There's glass everywhere. I've got to make sure that, you know, one of these seven kids doesn't cut themselves on the on the glass. Um, you know, I, I can't get um, you know the wife to help me because you know it's it's her day to not do this. It's it's all on my own, and I'm just I can't handle it. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of things going on. That and yeah, wow. So the number one thought I'm having is this is not uncommon. I'm sure for parents, both men and women, both moms and dads. Right. This is probably happening every day all across the world. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. It happens all the time, every day. And, you know, it it happens with two kids. You don't have to just wait to be in a seven kid family. (laughs) You know, it it happens because we've got so much stuff going on these days as parents. So, you know, we've got our own 
um, you know, our own jobs that we got to do, deal with. Maybe we've got a whole bunch of deadlines going on. You know, we've got, you know, each kid has their own needs they need to be fulfilled. Kids, as we know, they have very little patience, very little tolerance, and they're very egocentric. So when they want the attention from mum and dad, they want it now, and they don't want to wait in line after their brother's finished getting it. They want it now, and so that's when siblings start to compete and they get that sibling rivalry thing happening. Mm -hmm. And so now parents are aware, oh, crap, kids are all fighting for my attention. I feel like I'm being pulled in two different directions and then another direction because of this and then whatever else is going on. You know, because because you know, there's lots happening. It's not just work and family. There's you know, uh, you know, thousands of different things going on. It's all unique to everyone else. Right. So the best thing a parent could probably do to prevent any of those backlashes towards children or even their spouse or anything is what? How how do they manage that every day if these things are building up? Um. Well, so. First of all, um, what they can do is, if, if they're able to, um, outsource some of it. So if you know, if you're in a in a two parent family, so I I wasn't, I was in a single parent family, so it's a bit harder. But if you can delegate anything else out to the partner, do that, and then sort of look. You know, that saying it takes a village to raise a child. Look at who else is in your village so have you got grandparents that are involved have you got um babysitters or nannies or or anyone else that's involved Mm -hmm. you know if if a kid is struggling with their homework for instance and you don't have the time the patience or even understanding to to deal with that outsource that hire a tutor and bring them in to help them with the homework you know um so that's that's one option um another option is self-care um, you know, taking care of yourself, making sure all of your um, physical, psychological needs are met. Because when you know you take care of yourself, um, you can then give the best to other people. When you are completely stressed out and run down, you're not giving your best. That's when you you do snap, or even when you give up completely. Um, you know, have you had that expression? You can't give from an empty cup. Yeah. Yeah, so self-care is almost like keeping your cup filled. Um, also, too, uh, really, um, and this is a good one f- for kids to learn because we've sort of got it in our heads that as soon as the kids make a noise, we have to give them what they want because that will shut them up. Mm-hmm. However, it's best for the kids sometimes to ignore what, what they're wanting for now. You know, if, if you're trying to do something and it's a higher priority and, you know, your kid wants you to look at, say, a, a picture they drew, which is important to acknowledge. I'm not saying don't do that, but have a look at what priority it's in. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if that can wait, you can ignore the child and then kids realize, okay, I don't get the attention whenever I want it and there's other things going on and sometimes I have to wait and that starts to teach patience as well. Um, but, you know, you, you're eventually going to get to them. You, you will get to them and have a look at what they've done and, and do that, but it's got to come in the right priority order. And then if, if people are unable to really help make that work because it's, it's all about a balance, then, you know, seeking some help, seeking some counselling or some sort of therapy to help you deal with stuff and and work out a plan to to do that better. Oh, that's great suggestions right there. So, Rodney, you're working on a book. Tell us what that's about when you expect to have it out and what, what the impetus was, what kind of got the genesis of it going. Okay, so the book is called Eat Fruit, Laugh and Have Sex, 101 Ways to Reduce Stress. Wow. And, great title. And what it, what 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 it do, what I've done is I've come up with 101 different tools and techniques people can use every day to reduce stress. So it it fits in well with what we were saying, and um, it's essentially uh, what I want people to treat it as is like a toolbox. So you have it there for when you need it, and then you go to it. And you know, so when you're feeling stressed out, you look up something, oh, okay, I can breathe. That's something I can do now to help me reduce stress. And over time, you'll practice and develop all these different tools, and you've got them in your, in your toolbox so you can help yourself deal with any um, 
you know, with any any uh, sort of stressful situation that comes up. And in, in my work, as, because I work a lot with, with men, I, I need to talk in terms that they understand. So when I have any of these little exercises, I like to call them tools because when blokes here, they get to play with tools, they then all of a sudden light up and I have their attention. Mm-hmm. And so I work a lot with, you know, with just different tools that people can use for life. So, you know, there's, there's tools for managing stress and managing anger and managing depression and, and all sorts of stuff. So this is actually just the first in a series of different books, which is just going to give people tools they need to manage different things in life. Well, that's very exciting. We'll have to have you back on the show when that is released so you can talk about it. So, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come back. Yeah, that'd be great. So keep me apprised of that. So last but not least, uh, give us <laughs> a, an idea of where we can get in contact with you. Uh, you are in Australia, but which, mm-hmm. by the way, which city are you in? I'm in Sydney, Australia. Okay. okay. I have some family living in Perth, and I believe that's quite a distance away, right? Yeah, it's it's only on the other side of the country. <laughs> Only like the it's, difference it's, between it's, New York and Vegas, right? <laughs> probably. I'm not so good at my geography, so I'll take your word for it. No, same. Um, so yeah. <laughs> we should both learn the other hemisphere. <laughs> so, yeah, but if, if people want to find me, um, so my website is www.blokesupport.com.au. And I'll, I'll just I'll explain because I've come to realize that Bloke is not really a word that people in the U.S. are familiar with. <laughs> uh, so, so bloke is 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 a man. That's what it is. If you hear someone talking about a bloke, it's it's a man. So that's oh, that's all it is. That's great. Um, yeah. So that's www.blokesupport.com.au. Uh, I'm on Facebook. So if you just look up bloke support, you'll you'll find me. Uh, Instagram again is is bloke support. Periscope. At bloke support, you, you're getting getting the drift. Yes. But yeah, also, also YouTube, um, bloke support TV. You can find uh, various videos I've done there. Wonderful. Well, we appreciate your time and sharing with us this valuable information, and wish you luck as you keep working on your book and continue making a difference in this world. So thank you for helping our audience power their lives. Thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome. <laughs>